boring like everything else is an opinion. Just like claiming a video game is mind-blowing or relaxing, stating an experience is boring lies in subjectivity. However, there are recurring traits in all forms of media which lend themselves to boredom. We all feel the strain when something is repetitive, lacks any sort of surprise or emotional depth, has zero challenge, or is plainly not fun. On the one hand, shallower experiences can be quite good. For a lack of challenge or emotional investment offers respite from the hecticness of real life. When these experiences drag on for multiple hours though, as in the video games in this rundown, we can argue more objectively on the aspects that make them boring. Shinmu 3 Shinmu 3 is best thought of as a time capsule. Its masterful replication of the first two games' stately aesthetic, their mellow ambiance and focused mundanity was a pleasure for longtime fans. However, its ponderous progression gives players opportunity to immerse themselves in everyday routine while barely advancing the series' as a story arc. Shinmu 3's narrative itself is frustratingly predictable, structured in two halves, with essentially the same storyline played out twice. Throughout the game's first half, set in the idyllic Bailu village, Ryu bounces between NPCs seeking the whereabouts of a martial arts grandmaster. Later, in bustling the Awu, Ryu seeks out yet another martial arts master. Very early on in this second act, it's wholly predictable where the story's going. Within a 15 to 20 hour runtime and no climactic finale by game's end, it's understandable some longtime fans feel disappointment in Shinmu 3. Days Gone the thrill of outrunning hordes of infected freakers in open world apocalypse days gone isn't enough to overcome its tedium. Protagonist Deacon St. John's journey through a zombie ravaged Oregon is played with repetition, far outstaying its welcome across the campaign's 35 to 40 hour runtime. Most missions are structured akin to fetch quests, rescue hostages, track down traders, clear out camps, rinse, repeat, etc. Stealth missions offer some variety, but they're overly forgiving and altogether too easy. Elsewhere, the heartfelt backstory established at the game's outset, focusing on the death of Deacon's wife, gives us emotional investment in Deacon's story. When new characters and antagonists emerge later, without this same emotional setup, it's admittedly hard to care what happens to them. In fact, there's high chance you'll be worn out by the game's bloated world by this point. Had the developers trimmed some of Days Gone's bloat, then the unique scenarios in which the game does well wouldn't have felt so diluted. Tom Clancy's The Division The proposition of running rampant in a tactical third-person action shooter with a virus-stricken New York is undoubtedly appealing. The winter-strewn open-world Manhattan, blighted by gun-toting factions vying for power in the quarantined city, is oftentimes stunning. Collectibles add interest, fleshing out the backstory of those caught in the mayhem at the pandemic's outset. Spend a great deal of time in this world, though, and you will, with the campaign's 30 or so hour runtime, and you'll undoubtedly feel disengaged by game's end. The deserted streets are barren, with enemy encounters sporadic. When you do encounter opposing forces, there's a high chance you'll feel frustrated by their superhuman ability to absorb a full round of bullets before hitting the deck. Couple this with a huge amount of repetitive fetch quest side missions, and the division feels like a whole lot of promise in the game's E3 reveal trailer unfulfilled. Mafia 3 Yet another visually stunning game world let down by unimaginative open world mission design. Mafia 3 takes place in New Bordeaux, a stand in for New Orleans in the late 60s. Its world design is top notch, with heavy social themes interweaved into the game's locales. Its overarching story is well written too, undoubtedly keeping enough players engaged throughout the campaign's 30 or so hour runtime. It's just that once again, missions frequently involve acquiring objectives, driving to locations, killing, destroying, or both. Essentially, it's mission structure we've seen in open world games for two decades. For a game as lengthy as Mafia 3, this lack of originality starts to bite early on. 
Couple this with stealth mechanics that are far too forgiving due to dumb AI that oftentimes outright refuse to stay in cover. A quick whistle and they'll come running to you one at a time. Just take them down and move on to the next. Dead Island. First person zombie action horror Dead Island plays somewhat like an audition to Techland's superior Dying Light. Sure, the popcorn action grindhouse aesthetic and vibrant world is stimulating, but Dead Island is littered with pacing issues, denying its status as one of the greats. The fetch quest mission design typical of the other open world games on this rundown are present in Dead Island 2, but really the main issue is the flawed upgrade system. See, as you upgrade your player character, the enemy zombies become harder to kill. This renders your upgrades kind of pointless, as you won't feel yourself getting any stronger. Combat and its accompanying tactics, while fantastic fun at first, won't evolve as the game progresses. These issues might have been nitpicking were Dead Island a shorter game. A refined 10 or so hours instead of the 25 plus hours to complete the main story would have sufficed. Resident Evil 6 Fair enough, if it's endless bombastic action you're after, you can do no wrong with Resident Evil 6. It's just that the third person gunplay doesn't let up across the game's four interweaving campaigns. Despite some memorable set pieces, the game overall feels altogether lazily crafted, like the designers took more influence by what was popular at the time rather than playing to Resident Evil's strengths up to that point. Survival horror should feel as though you're clinging on to life after each encounter. Scouring through creepy atmosphere in search of scarce resources are hallmarks of the genre. Resident Evil 6 abandons these traits they pioneered in favor of all-out Michael Bay style action, with gunfights aplenty. If we accept this isn't a survival horror game, we're still left with too much of a good thing, and that's the thing with overabundance. It becomes stale. Watch Dogs. Watch Dogs appears at first to cherry pick its component parts from other open world titles. What sets this title apart though is its relatively unique hacking mechanic. However, you'd think the ability to hack into any electronic device or system within the city of Chicago would present numerous interesting scenarios. In practice though, the mechanic begins to stagnate as its one button aiming is too easy to pull off. Couple this with a predictable story with unambitious antagonists, then we're left with something that'll feel like a grind to complete. Seriously, if you were a villain with the power to survey every device in the city, you'd use it for something more sinister than keeping your mates out of trouble, right? Lego Harry Potter The Collection the collection bundles LEGO Harry Potter years 1 through 4 and years 5 through 7, originally released in 2010 and 2011 into one lengthy experience. These games were relatively early on in TT Games' LEGO series, and as such, lack the polish of LEGO games that followed. Most notable is the lack of voice acting, charming for sure, but it does require players to do the heavy lifting in terms of storyline. If you're not familiar with the Harry Potter books or movies, then you'll struggle with the lack of cohesive narrative these games possess. Overlooking that issue, one of the major draws for LEGO games is the opportunity to revisit locations to obtain collectibles once the story is over. For Harry Potter, there's still students to rescue, spells to learn, and environmental puzzles to solve, but it's all just too simple. Undertaking all activities in the collection puts total play time at over 50 hours. With such little variety in collectibles, that's just too long, even for the most devoted Potter fan. Mass Effect Andromeda Despite its superb action sequences and improved combat, Mass Effect Andromeda overall is a disappointing follow-up to the original Mass Effect trilogy. It's still a worthy sci-fi action RPG, sure, but its story falls foul of retreading similar plot lines, with a largely forgettable supporting cast. It's arguably the open format of the game's environments that are its biggest disservice, though. They're vast and mostly empty, aside from overly repeated structures and landforms, and while exploration can be fun with a range of vehicles on offer, there are far too many fetch quests. 
It all feels like unnecessary padding, taking the game to a required 100 plus hours to see and do everything. With gameplay at launch beset by many a distracting glitch, it's hard to see how this game could remain fun throughout its gargantuan runtime. Raven's Cry Open world pirate adventure Raven's Cry is besieged by a shopping list's worth of problems. Its animations are clunky, its sword fights button mashy, its enemy NPCs laughably sway from side to side as if swinging to a rhythmless beat. I could go on. Raven's Cry is so undercooked, you can't help but be amused. Nothing works. If you played this game to its 40 hour runtime, then bravo. And that brings us to the end of this video. A quick request before we conclude, we upload new videos every single day and if you like what we're doing, please consider subscribing. It really, really helps us out. Also, don't forget to enable all your notifications by clicking the bell icon so that you can receive daily video updates. Thanks for watching.